Welcome to ACCA paper P7, Advanced Audit and Assurance. My name's Paul Merrison. I've been teaching auditing subjects for around about the last 12 years. I, as well as being a tutor, have of course been a student just like you. I've also been an auditor in the real world. I've been the head of training at a firm of auditors, so I've trained auditors doing the job for real rather than just passing the exams. I've also been a marker and I've been an examiner, so hopefully I've seen this from every angle necessary to get you the pass that you need. Well, that's enough about me for the time being. You may find out a little bit more if you watch all the videos and listen carefully. But let's have a little think about paper P7, the exam, the examiner, and let's start off by considering how P7 is different to the other audit paper that you've probably sat, F8 the lower level audit paper. So what's different on P7? Firstly, let's consider the F8 syllabus, the one that hopefully you've already passed. To what extent is knowledge of the F8 syllabus going to help you on P7? And the answer is it will help you a little bit. The basics of how to carry out an external audit of a company's financial statements are exactly the same on P7 as they were on F8. So to a great extent, there is no new audit theory to actually learn. So on F8, you considered things like ethics, should my firm actually be doing this audit in the first place? Or are there ethical issues that mean someone else should do it? And that's on this syllabus too. You considered audit planning. You looked at materiality, analytical procedures, and you looked at audit risk, identifying those areas of the financial statements most likely to have errors. And yes, all of that is on this exam too. You looked at internal control systems and assessing them, and that's on this exam, although not quite as much as F8. And you looked at substantive testing. Testing the actual numbers and disclosures in a set of financial statements directly by looking for supporting evidence. And that is very much on this syllabus. You then did some completion work. Things like assessing going concern, subsequent events, and all of that's on the syllabus too. And then you signed an audit report. And guess what? That's on the syllabus too. Now you might therefore ask the question, if all of the F8 stuff is also on this syllabus, what's different? The answer is that while the theory and the methodology is the same, the set of financial statements that you are auditing will be more complicated here. The main difference between P7 and F8 is that whilst you're still carrying out an audit of a company's financial statements, here, the accounting standards that are coming up will be more complicated. So I suppose the first big tip, the first big piece of advice for this exam is don't focus too much on the word audit. Instead, make sure your financial reporting knowledge is up to scratch. Now that, of course, raises the question, which accounting standards do I need to know? Well, if you look at where P7 comes in the series of exams, it's the very last one. So obviously, this exam is harder than everything else. Well, no, not really. But it does mean, of course, that this exam comes after not just F7, financial reporting, but also P2, the more advanced financial reporting paper, corporate reporting. Which means, I'm afraid, in theory at least, any accounting standard, either on the F7 syllabus or on the P2 syllabus, could come up on this exam. And if you don't know the accounting issues, how can you tell me what might be wrong in that set of accounts, the audit risks? How can you tell me the audit work you do if you don't know what the problems are? And how can you tell me an audit report if you can't spot what's wrong in a set of accounts? 
so I'm afraid your accounting knowledge is pretty fundamental. Just as a police officer cannot enforce the law if they don't know the laws, likewise an auditor can't check a set of accounts if you don't know the accounting rules. It's critical, and it's one of the main reasons that people who fail this paper fail it. Not a lack of auditing skills, a lack of accounting knowledge. The good news, if there is any good news here, is that the accounting standards that historically have come up on this exam have tended to be accounting standards that you're probably fairly comfortable with. So whilst things like deferred tax, maybe even pensions, foreign exchange, financial instruments, could all come up, the ones that the examiners of this paper have tended to prefer are things like intangible assets, impairment, provisions and contingencies, post-balance sheet events, or as we should probably now call them, events after the reporting period. And all of those standards are actually F7 standards rather than P2. So do be warned, any accounting standard pretty much could come up. But in reality, the harder ones from an accounting perspective don't come up that often. OK, so there's the first thing we've considered. The fact that this exam is still auditing, but it's harder accounting areas that you need to audit. But notice that the title of the paper is not Advanced Auditing, it's Advanced Auditing and Assurance. So let's now consider the other stuff on this paper. Assurance services, what are they? Well, an assurance service is, strangely enough, any service where assurance is created. But you've probably worked that bit out already. What is assurance? Well, uh, if you walk out of your house in the morning and your mother, father, husband, wife says, you look good today, they're giving you assurance. They are assuring you that the way you look is good. Assurance is the provision of an opinion. It is giving an opinion on something else. Now, of course, one type of assurance is the external audit, as the external auditor gives an opinion on the truth and fairness of a company's financial statements. But unlike the F8 paper, where virtually the entire syllabus is about that external audit process, one other difference for P7 is that here we look at other types of assurance in a lot more detail. What types of assurance will we look at? Well, the first one on the list, I suppose, is something that is on F8 as well. It is internal audit. This is where a team of qualified people, internal auditors, go into a company, but instead of looking at their published accounts and checking the accuracy of those, they instead look at the company's internal systems, risk management and internal controls, and advise the company on how well those are working. So apart from internal audit, which you have studied a bit on F8, what other assurance services might come up on this exam? Well, as you may well be aware, if we look at what happens in a company's annual report, we don't just get published financial figures anymore, do we? As you may have seen on P2, in a company's annual report, We've got the financial statements, of course. But on top of that, these days, companies are providing a lot of other information as well. Things like social and environmental data, pollution data, the percentage of their rubbish that they recycle, donations to charity, how they treat their employees and things like that. This corporate social responsibility stuff, if they're going to disclose it, potentially creates a problem. Because people reading the annual report think they can trust the financial figures because they've been audited, but what about all this non-financial stuff? So some companies are now employing firms of accountants, often specialist departments within firms of accountants, to check out this social and environmental data and give opinions on its accuracy. 
Again, a sort of audit. Now, a social and environmental audit could actually be one of maybe two different things. It could be someone checking the data that's been disclosed in the annual report and giving an opinion on its accuracy. But before companies can actually disclose data, they need to know what data they should be disclosing. So companies may well go to specialists, ask them to come into their companies, and advise them on what their social and environmental issues actually are, and tell them how well they're doing at the moment. And that also might be described as a form of social and environmental audit. Now, if you're starting to get a bit nervous at how specialist that last subject seems to be, I wouldn't get too worried. It doesn't seem to get tested in much detail, and when it does come up, it's fairly rare. But there are one or two other areas of assurance that come up quite a lot. One of them is called due diligence. So, the question is, what does due diligence mean? Well, if I said to you, carry out your work diligently, what I'm saying is, carry it out carefully. So due diligence is about taking care with something. Taking care with what? Well, the phrase due diligence could in fact be applied to many things in the world and it's not just to do with the world of accountancy and finance. For example, if you were to buy a new house, before you actually go through with the transaction, there are quite a few things you'd like to check out. For example, you need to make sure that the person selling you the house does actually own it. Otherwise, after you move in, you may find someone else coming and living with you, which is not really that helpful. And then, of course, there's the danger that what you think you're buying is not actually what you're buying. So you buy the house and you see the big space out the back and think, that's my garden, because that's what they told you. Except it turns out that shortly before you turned up, they moved the fences back to make the garden look bigger. Now you've bought it, you find that part of your garden belongs to someone else. And how would you feel if you bought a house and six weeks later, a large supermarket chain built a massive supermarket right at the back of your house? Huge parking problems, huge amounts of traffic, and that lovely view you had is now a supermarket. And in some countries, you have all sorts of bizarre rules. There might, for example, be a public footpath straight through your garden, or worse, your kitchen. So with things like that possibly happening, naturally you want to take a bit of care, a bit of diligence, to make sure, as far as you can, that that stuff won't happen. Now, you can't check that stuff out because you don't know. You're just buying a house. You get experts to do it. And that's one of the reasons why, when you buy houses, you involve lawyers who check this stuff out for you and, of course, then charge you for doing so. So that's an example, I suppose, of due diligence. Checking a few things out before you go through with a deal. On this exam, when we talk about due diligence, what we're really talking about are mergers and acquisitions. Because if you're about to buy another company or merge with it, I'd check a few things out before you do so, if I were you. For example, let's imagine that you bought a football club. A lot of people seem to be doing that at the moment. So let's say you buy Liverpool Football Club. Well, what a great team you've got. Wonderful history, they've won trophies, and they've got some great players. Or have they? You see, if I'm a professional footballer, when I go to a particular club, how do I choose that club compared with all the others? Obviously, my salary is going to have something to do with it, but with the sort of money I'm earning, I can take a slightly lower salary somewhere else if I think it's better for me. And, of course, I now think about how that team's going to play. Will I play every week? Will I be the superstar in the team? And that means I want to get on with the manager, and I want to get on with the owners. 
Because with football teams, often the owners could be one or two individuals. Powerful personalities. Now, the danger is that if I'm a professional footballer and go to a club with this owner, if six months later he sells up to another owner, maybe that owner has a very different idea about how football should be played. Maybe the manager now gets sacked. Maybe I now sit on the bench every game instead of playing. Maybe they want to get rid of me. Because I'm a professional footballer, and hopefully fairly well known, I've got a bit of power in the negotiations. So before I sign up to a football team, I may well insist that in my contract it says something like this. If ownership of the club changes, the player has the right to immediately cancel the contract and leave the club for no fee. So just imagine you buy Liverpool Football Club. And you turn up one Monday morning to come and say hello to the players that effectively you've just bought. And you find them all packing their kit away, climbing into their Ferraris and leaving the ground. What's going on, you say? One of the players hands you his contract and says, we've all got these. And you discover that you've just bought a football club and all the footballers have decided to leave. Because in their contracts, they can. Now, if that sounds a bit extreme, bear this thought in mind. Imagine you're a company and you need some new property. You decide to take out a lease. This involves signing an agreement that says you'll be paying money monthly, quarterly or maybe annually into the future. The owner of the building, before they sign this lease with you, will surely check out your credit history to make sure you're likely to keep the payments going. Naturally, if ownership of your company now changes, the ability of your company to pay its bills may also change. So there's a fairly good chance that in that lease agreement it says, if ownership of the company changes, the owner of the building reserves the right to cancel the lease. Because they now will want to check out the credit history of the new owners to make sure that this lease is still a good lease for them. If there's any difference in the credit worthiness of the new owners, OK, the lease may carry on, but they may wish to rene uh, renegotiate terms and maybe make you pay more or maybe pay less. So when you buy a company, you need to make sure that you understand things like their lease agreements, employee contracts, loan agreements, because there's every danger that when you take ownership, all of those agreements may change. So you need to know what those agreements say so you know what you're getting yourself into. Now that's just a bit of a taster of the concept of due diligence, and of course if you buy another company, you're going to send your accountants and your lawyers in to check out all of this sort of stuff. And if you've got accountants checking things out, it can't be that different to an audit, really, can it? It's about getting evidence to check the facts are true. It's pretty similar. But there are other areas of assurance which maybe aren't that similar to an audit. For example, sometimes companies call in experts and say, tell us what our risks are and whether we're managing them properly. No mention of the financial statements in here. This is about corporate risk advice. Business risk. And that is a topic that has come up on this exam fairly frequently. Now, of course, as an auditor, having hopefully passed the F8 paper, you have heard of risk with audits, haven't you? The audit risk approach. This is a different animal. Business risk is very different to audit risk. So, for example, if you spotted foreign exchange transactions in a question, if you're an auditor you might be concerned that those transactions have been translated at the wrong exchange rate. So naturally, you'd check that out. What if you're a business risk analyst? Well, if you're looking at business risk, the risk to the company, well, OK, inaccurate accounts is a problem, but surely the bigger risk with foreign exchange is the risk of exchange losses, of exchange rates moving in a direction which damages the company and threatens its very survival. 
So as a business risk advisor, surely what you'll be saying is, hedge, understand your foreign exchange exposures and where necessary, use hedging techniques. A very different answer to the audit risk question. So, those are a few examples, and there are plenty more, by the way, a few examples of the other assurance services that firms of accountants provide, as well as checking the annual financial statements. Now, I've already suggested that one very important tip on this exam is to know your accounting standards. But there are one or two other tips that are worth giving you at this early stage before we start looking at the actual syllabus, because they're tips which pretty much cover any answer you ever write. For more specific tips, we'll cover those when we get to the appropriate area of the syllabus. But these general tips are very, very important, and again are one of the reasons that people fail the exam. Tip number one. This is a high-level exam paper. It's a professional-level exam, and therefore you're expected to do a bit more than just list out facts. We want explanations. So tip number one is whenever you say anything, try to remember to explain why. I would test this because, or in order to, prove this. So wherever possible, say why. A second tip, which again is very important, and you'll see this when we start looking at exam questions. This exam is a real-time exam. What does that mean? Well, let's, for example, say that you are a student at the December 2008 sitting. So you will sit the exam in early December 2008. OK, uh, let's now say we're looking at question one, and question one says you are planning an audit for the year ended 31st of October 2008. Let's just look at those dates on a little timeline so we know where we are. So, today's date is December, you're auditing a company's year-end to the 31st of October. So what? Well, let's imagine that you read through the story and you identify that this company has got lots of inventory, stocks in other words. As part of your answer, you suggest that attending the stock take, the annual inventory count, might be a fairly sensible piece of audit work. But there's a problem, you see. If the company only counts its inventory once a year, when are they likely to do it? Answer? Probably the 31st of October. And it's now December, a month and a bit later. So by all means write in your answer, we will attend the client's annual stock take, but bear in mind that unless you now add the sentence, I will therefore acquire a time machine, travel back in time and do it, it's physically impossible. It's too late. The stock take was a month ago, so please don't tell me you'll attend it. Now, of course, you may have attended it. Maybe a month and a bit ago you did turn up. You don't know that unless the question tells you. So if you wish, say in your answer, I assume we attended the stock take but please don't plan to attend it, it's too late. So it's a real-time exam. There will be dates in some of the questions. Make sure you remember that you are sitting the exam in December 08 or June 09 or whenever it is you're sitting it, and look at all the dates in respect of that date when you're sitting. The dates are very important. 
Now, when I plan answers to questions, and when we start doing questions, you'll see what I do. When I plan answers to questions, whenever there are dates, I always draw a very quick timeline. Because often you can discover some very interesting things. And just as we take this tip a bit further, if I was drawing a timeline, automatically I'd add something else onto the timeline on our screen. I would put on the previous year end. Why? Well, first of all, we now see the accounting year that we're actually auditing, and that can be quite helpful. But the main reason I do it is that I've seen a lot of exam questions where you're told that something happened maybe in July 2007, which is in the previous accounting year. Now, if that's the case, and this is the first news we've had of that event, Maybe that means last year's accounts were wrong. And that opens up a whole new problem. And there's another thing as well. If it's December 2008 and the question says plan the audit for the 31st of October 2008 year end, what do you suspect that your firm was doing in December 2007, 12 months ago? The answer is probably planning the previous audit. Now, just consider that thought. At some point during the accounting period that we are now auditing, we were actually at this company doing last year's audit. Which means that anything that happened in the accounting year before you were doing last year's audit the early part of the year, last year's audit team should have seen as part of their post-balance sheet events review, their subsequent events. So if you're finding out something this year that happened very early in the accounting year, we should ask the question, why did last year's audit team not know about this? It may have been happening while they were there, and if they didn't know about it, does this suggest they might have got last year's audit wrong? Now, obviously I'm jumping ahead a bit here into what can be some fairly complicated issues. But just watch out with dates in questions. As you'll see when we start doing questions, and we'll be doing them from a very early stage in this presentation, dates are often very relevant to the answer. And a failure to spot the issues with timings can lead to the completely wrong answer being provided. So it's a real-time exam, and watch those dates. Now, I've already said a few seconds ago how we are going to be doing quite a few questions during this presentation. The main reasons for that are that the main technical knowledge you actually need for this exam are the audit processes you know from F8 and the accounting knowledge that you should know from F7 and P2. So most of the knowledge should be there already. Really, for this exam, we need to do questions and learn from doing them. And the good news is that although we have a new examiner on P7, it's not the same examiner who did the, the old advanced audit paper 3.1, the two examiners know each other very well, and the new paper is already looking, in most respects, pretty similar to the old one. We have lots of past questions, and this exam has proved pretty consistent over the years. So question practice is very, very helpful. Now, we seem to have started talking about the examiner, so I suppose it would be a good time to talk about her, the examiner, and also the exam itself. Firstly, let's consider the examiner. The examiner for P7 is called Lisa Weaver. Uh, Lisa Weaver is a tutor, just like me. In fact, I used to work for the same company where she works. 
So Lisa Weaver is fairly well known by those who teach this course. Um, she is predominantly uh, an advanced financial reporting lecturer, and that is why your accounting knowledge is so important for this exam, because I'm afraid your examiner's knowledge is pretty good. Is there anything else you need to know about her? Um, not really. Uh, the questions she's been asking so far have been fairly clear as to what they need, what they mean, um, and to a great extent, she's a pretty predictable examiner, and a very fair examiner as well. But there is one point, I think, that's worth knowing at this, uh, this stage. This is an option paper. As such, your examiner believes that you've chosen to do this option because you have an interest in auditing and an interest in working in auditing. The ACCA and the examiners in particular will say over and over again how much easier a paper like this would be if you do actually work in audit. Because then you understand the practical issues more because you're dealing with them day by day. As an experienced tutor, I have to say I don't fully agree with this. Consistently, students pass this exam who don't work in audit at all. In fact, many people pass this exam who've never worked at all. So whilst an understanding of business is helpful, you can actually pick up a lot of what you need from doing past exam questions. So please don't get too worried by this. Oh, and by the way, if you do work in audit and are now rubbing your hands together thinking, ha-ha, I have an advantage over everybody else, think again. Bear in mind this is an advanced audit paper. If you work in audit and you're still doing your professional exams, you're not likely to be the senior partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers, are you? In fact, there's probably a good chance that you're not a partner, and there's a pretty good chance you're not a manager, and in fact, if you're working in audit and doing these exams, you're probably not that senior at all. Given this is an advanced paper, I'm afraid much of the work you do may not be at a sufficiently high enough level to be the sort of stuff that gets tested on here. Now, apologies if that sounds like a put-down, and I'm sure you're now watching this going, absolute rubbish, I am the senior partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers. And if that's the case, fantastic. But just bear that in mind. Please don't get complacent. I've seen plenty of students over the years who work for big firms of auditors who don't pass this paper first time. You've still got to practice the questions, I'm afraid, just like everybody else. OK, so the examiner is called Lisa Weaver. Before she was the examiner, she was also the assessor for the previous version of this paper under the old syllabus. So while she's only been the examiner for a little while, she has been involved in the writing of the exam in the past. The previous examiner... was called Kim Smith. And it's worth knowing that because there are quite a few articles out there that appeared in Student Accountant that were written by Kim Smith. Good, helpful, practical articles on subjects that are very much still on this exam paper. So, we've now considered the examiner. Let's have a look at the exam paper itself and the big topics that we'll be covering on the course. The exam paper will have five questions on it. The first two are compulsory, and then you have to choose two from the remaining three. Now, under the previous syllabus, we got a very similar exam paper every single time. Again, you had questions one and two, rather like the new syllabus, that were two big questions. But you also had a question three that was always worth 20 marks and always on the same subject. And then you had questions four, five and six that were always worth 15 each. The new examiner has said that whilst the syllabus hasn't really changed that much, 
She does want the freedom to change the structure of the exam as she so wishes. So questions one and two will be two big questions. But what the marks add up to may well vary. And on the first two sittings of the paper, they have varied. So, to be honest, we don't know how much they'll add up to. Officially, it's somewhere between 50 and 70. I would normally expect it to be somewhere in the sort of 60, maybe 60 to 70 range. And then questions three to five. You'll be doing two of those. And, of course, the marks depend on what the marks for the first two questions were, so there's not much point worrying about that. So that's the structure of the exam. Question is, what sort of things are likely to come up? What are my priorities when it comes to studying? Well, across those five questions, most of the syllabus is likely to come up, I'm afraid. So I would not avoid areas of this syllabus and then hope they don't get examined. That is a very dangerous tactic. But there are obviously some topics that are more important than others. So what are the big ones? One of the two biggest topics on the paper tends to be risk. The ability to identify or spot risks from stories and, of course, then talk about what you'll do about them. Now, we've already seen that there are more than one type of risk on the paper. I've mentioned audit risk that you've seen on F8. I've also mentioned business risk, where you advise companies on the risks that the company faces rather than risks directly to their accounts. And very similar to audit risk, you may also get a question that asks for financial statement risks, We'll look at it more when we cover risk, but it's pretty much the same as audit risk. Anyway, that's a risk question, and on virtually any paper, I would expect a big risk analysis question of some type, possibly more than one question, and this will normally be compulsory. The other big area, which will probably be in the compulsory questions and probably also in one of the other questions, is audit testing, audit work, audit evidence, whatever you want to call it. The ability to describe the audit procedures you would carry out and explain why is absolutely fundamental to being a good auditor. Remember, we don't go into every company and check their accounts the same way we checked the last company we did. Much of the procedure is the same, but the actual work we do has got to be targeted to the company in question. And it's that ability to target your audit work which is fundamental to passing the paper. Those are the two biggest topics. They're the topics we'll spend the most time on and the topics we'll do the most question practice for. And to a great extent, if you're very good at those, you're probably pretty close to passing the paper already. But of course there are other topics as well. And if we did go down to sort of division two of the topics, the next most important, we come across these. Other assurance services is what I mentioned at the start of the course, and it's largely stuff that is not on the F8 syllabus, so this will appear fairly new to you. So this is the due diligence, the social environmental audits, business risk consultancy, stuff like that. The second one on the list, audit reports, is again something you saw on the F8 paper, and the good news is that the same audit report rules are on this paper, 
as what you saw on F8. There is no new knowledge. It is just about applying those rules and principles to more complicated accounting problems. Third one on the list is ethics, which seems to be on every ACCA exam paper these days. Now that ethics is on so many exam papers, including a massive chunk on the P1 paper, Professional Accountant, we expect going forward for there to be slightly fewer ethics questions on P7. Under the old advanced audit paper, it came up pretty much every time. But we still expect it to appear reasonably frequently. The good news about ethics is, again, if you've covered the F8 syllabus, as you should have done, you already know everything you need to know about ethics. It's just about applying it to more complicated situations. So whereas on F8, you might get a question that describes a situation that you've read in a textbook or read in your notes, so you probably know the answer. On this paper, your examiner may design a situation which is totally unique. You've never come across it before. So you can't learn the answer from a book. You've got to use your brain, use the principles you understand, and try to apply them. Same rules, same principles, harder situations. And as you're probably starting to realise, that is the theme to this exam. The knowledge is not going to cause you too many problems. It's applying it to the questions. The last one on the list is something that is not on the F8 syllabus. On F8, we only audit one set of accounts at a time, single company accounts. But of course, in the real world, the biggest company audits do not involve one company. They involve parents, subsidiaries, associates, maybe even joint ventures. And then, of course, as well as all the individual companies in the group and the accounts they prepare, we add them all together and call it consolidation, which creates another set of accounts to check. Now, this creates a lot of issues, some accounting and some practical. If you're the auditor of a group and you're the auditor at the top, you audit the parent company, then presumably you've got two sets of accounts to check, parent plus consolidated. And of course, in some groups, it would probably make sense if you are the auditor of all the subsidiaries as well, which means you've got a very big task. All those sets of accounts to check before you can then add them up and make sure the consolidated figures are OK. But what if you're not the auditor of the entire group? There are plenty of situations in the real world where there will be other firms of auditors auditing some of the subsidiaries. And if that's the case, all sorts of additional problems open up. It's not a majorly difficult area, group audits, but it does raise some issues that you've probably not come across before. And it's a very topical area. As worldwide companies get bigger and bigger, there's far more likelihood, especially with the internationalisation of this process, with groups being in many different countries, far more chance that more than one firm of auditor is involved. And that creates lots of issues that we're going to need to look at. Expect group audits to be very heavily examined over the next few years. Now, that's not the entire syllabus we've looked at. Those are the biggest areas. I just want to mention one or two of the other areas, partly because we see them fairly early in the course. So we'll come across these again soon. First on this list is practice management. What does that mean? Well, a practice is a firm of accountants, just as you could have a firm of solicitors or a doctor's surgery that might also be called practices. So if a practice is a firm of accountants, practice management must be issues involved in managing, running a firm of accountants. 
So if you were the senior partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers or any other firm, what sort of things do you have to worry about in running your organisation? Well, of course, some of them are issues that any organisation faces. Keeping customers happy, pricing, advertising, reputation, quality control. So to a great extent, this is not the most difficult area on the syllabus, as many of the issues will be relatively obvious to you. Practice management will meet fairly early on. It doesn't get tested a huge amount, but there are one or two things in there which seem to be a little bit topical at the moment. The second one on this list is money laundering, which we're going to meet very early in the syllabus. What is money laundering? Well, money laundering is, as the name suggests, cleaning up money. What's dirty money? Well, dirty money is money that you've earned in ways you probably shouldn't have done, illegally, maybe by selling drugs, weapons, or maybe you've just robbed a bank. The problem is that if you've suddenly acquired $10 million, naturally people start to ask where it came from. So you need a good excuse. Now, you could, of course, say you won the lottery or had a good night at the casino, but things like this are relatively easy to check up on. What you need is to create some system that would make it look like you've earned your $10 million fairly and honestly. And one way to do that is to start up a company and claim you're making loads of profits. Now, when we look at this, you'll see that there are certain types of company where this could actually be done fairly simply. And if you're doing this via a company, then you probably will get audited. At the very least, you'll have some accountants around the place. And that's where we come in. This is on this syllabus because accountants and auditors are uniquely placed to be able to look out for clues or suspicions that money laundering is going on. Over the last few years, there's been a big push worldwide to try to eliminate worldwide crime and get rid of money laundering as far as we can. And there's a lot of pressure on accountants and auditors like us to use our skills, open our eyes, and be aware of what's happening in front of us and to report our suspicions to the necessary authorities. Now, that raises a number of issues, like how do I spot the clues? What does money laundering look like? And if I'm going to report my client to someone, does this not raise confidentiality issues? So there are quite a few issues involved in here. And the good news, or maybe it's good news, is that in order to spot money laundering, I'm going to have to train you in how to launder money. So I need your promise at this point that you will use this ethically and will not go out and start laundering money yourself. Please. Pretty please. OK. Well, that's probably enough about the background of this course, what it's all about, the syllabus, the main exam areas, because really none of this means much to you at the moment, does it? This is actually something that's more useful to go back to when we start revising. What we need to do is start looking at the technical areas on the course and start looking at questions.